Varman Isaac. Давид Давидович Резник. My name is Marina Abramovic, and I would like to present you Wall of Crying. My inspiration came from Western Wall in Jerusalem, and symbolically I bring this wall here. But this wall is not just about praying, it's the wall of remembering past, thinking about present, and also thinking about the future. I, the wall is made from coal, which is very dark and black material, and then from the coal come beautiful, clean, clear, luminous quartz. So it's everything about the darkness and light. Terrible things happened here 80 years ago. And uh, somehow we have to always learn our children to remember the past, but we also have to figure out how we can think about hope that this kind of things never happen again. This place is full of life. It's a park where the children come, so where the kids come in to play the, 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 you know, the, the, with the themselves. They come the lovers, they come the old people, the young people. So it's really about difficult things that happen here, but also about new life too. In order to make this work, I didn't want to make a sculpture, because sculpture is something that you look at it and that's it, and you go away. I want to make something which is interactive that actually every person himself can have direct experience. So I positioned the three crystals in a three body position, head, heart, and stomach. And all what I ask individuals is to face the wall in this position, you know, switch the telephone and breathe and relax and really think about what happened in this place. It's a place of memory. So which I would like now, you know, I will ask my, the, 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 the people who are already participating and you know, having this experience, I will ask all of you, please, especially three of you, the, the presidents, I have three reservation places for you to face there. And you know, I don't ask more, let's do it one minute and 20 seconds. That kind of is reasonable. Okay, please, I'm going to guide you. So. Раз, раз. We see the crystal welling wall made by the world famous artist Marina Abramovic. This wall symbolically prolongs the western wall of the Jerusalem temple, the so-called wailing wall. If you draw a line on the map from the Jerusalem western wall, it will cross in this exact place with a 10-meter error. The crystal whaling wall consists of an anthracite and quartz crystals. Visitors interact with crystals located at the level of their head, chest, and abdomen. The crystal whaling wall is the monument to Babania and the Holocaust that creates a special space where everyone can remember the tragic events of the past and meditate. Interaction with the natural state of courts aims to restore the connection of individual and collective memory through the sensations of the body. These days and also 
Now we will see the symbolic synagogue, a place of meditation. The unique structure is designed in the form of a book that opens and closes on its own accord. Interestingly, the building is made of centuries-old oak timber, originally coming from the ancient abandoned buildings from many regions of Ukraine. Symbolically, the synagogue and the place for meditation were designed by a Swiss architect. Manuel Hertz, Ukrainian engineers, artists and mechanics were involved in designing and the artworks. Designers Yaroslav Novitsky, Dmitro Pisarevsky, Vadim Artemenko and Alina Andrusenko's art teams worked on the monument with the help of the woodworking expert Vladimir Redin. Symbolically, the walls of the synagogue are decorated with patterns and texts of prayers that recreate the traditional painting of ancient synagogues in western Ukraine, destroyed uh, during uh, the World War II. The ceiling has the form of a map of the northern uh, stellar hemisphere, which reproduces position of the stars on the date of September the 29th, 1941, on the first day of the mass shootings in Babania. The symbolic synagogue is a place of mourning, a place for sacred assemblies and prayers to commemorate the victims of the tragedy of Babania. The honorary guests of the ceremony include President of Ukraine Volodymyr Zelensky, President of Israel Isaac Herzog, President of the Federal Republic of Germany Frank Walter Steinmeier, and his wife Elke Budenbender, Speaker of the Parliament of Georgia Kaha Kuchava, Speaker of the Swedish Riksdag Andreas Nolan, Marshal of the Senate of the Republic of Poland Tomasz Grodzki. Cantor Joseph Malavani. My name, my name is Joseph Malovani, Joseph Malovani, and I am 80 years young. I will explain what I mean. This day is an extremely important day in my life. Whilst I knew for many years about the horrible pogrom and killing of tens of thousands of Jews here in Babin Yar, little did I know that this unforgettable atrocity took place during the holiest day in the Jewish calendar named Yom Kippur, 1941. When I found out only recently this date, I was shocked, shocked all over my body and the reason is the following. I was born on this very day of Yom Kippur in Tel Aviv, Israel. Please think for a while the symbolism about it. Here in Babin Yar, tens of thousands of my brothers and sisters are brutally being killed and murdered in cold blood. And not too far, a little baby boy was born on that day in the land of Israel, 
the home of the Jewish people. His name is in Hebrew, Yosef, and in English and other languages, Joseph, and the family name is Malovani. And it is me, the cantor, who is going to sing the prayers today, who was born on that day. I repeat it. I therefore decided that on this very important day, my place to be and sing the ancient Jewish prayers of memorial and hope is here in Babin Yar with all of you. The day will remain in my head and, and heart for the rest of my life. Thank you very much. And now I will sing the memorial prayer. For the tens of thousands. Hey, Rahami Shochen Bamerohomi Amtsei Menuchan Echoena Yastirei 
Yiskadal v'yiskadash shemei rabo. Be'almad devarach yiruseh v'yamdich malchuseh v'yatzmach purkanei v'karev mishichei. V'chai echoi neviyem echoi nevachai d'chol beis Yisrael. Ba'agolo b'zman koriv v'imru amein. Yehei shemei rabo mevarach la'olam ulo'omei olmayo. Yisparach v'yishtabach v'yispeh v'yisraimam v'yisnasei. V'yisador v'yisale v'yisalol shemei d'kutcho b'richu. La'elo min kol b'chaso v'shiraso t'sh b'chaso v'nechmaso da'amiron b'almo v'imru amein. Yehei shlomar rabam in Shemaya v'chayim toivim aleinu v'al kol Yisrael v'imru amein. V'yaseh shalom b'imru amein v'yaseh shalom aleinu v'al kol Yisrael v'imru amein. The most famous cellist in the world, Misha Maisky.
President of Ukraine, Volodymyr Zelensky. In this place, the Nazis shot more than 100,000 people. In this place, it is difficult to speak. For thousands of years, it was occupied by silence alone. In this place, it is difficult to breathe because thousands of children took their last breath here. In this place it is difficult to stand. Thousands of bullets knocked those executed off their feet right here on this spot, in the Babinia, Levine. Steeped in pain and scream, blood and death. A place that God forsook forever and the devil escapes. This is the place. Eighty years ago, there were terrible crimes committed here. And the things I will talk about now are also horrible. And the most horrible of them all is that this is not a myth but real events that really took place, that happened to real people in a horrible reality called the Second World War, the occupation and the Holocaust. The pandemic of those viruses began in Kyiv on September 19, 1941. He was captured by the Nazis then. As experts in arrangement of cemeteries around the world, they immediately noticed a large deep ravine on the outskirts of the city, and the first blood in it was shed already a week after the invasion. The Nazis shot 752 patients of the Pavlov Psychiatric Hospital. And um, although killings um, were um, an unconditioned uh, reflex of the Nazis, they executed people for practical reasons, namely to calculate the capacity of the ravine to understand uh, whether it will be able to contain the number of corpses that would meet the ambitions which were exactly to kill on an industrial scale. Two days later, all Jews of Kiev were ordered to come here, allegedly to border a train to take them to Germany for works, but in fact, they were doomed for destruction. They were to take a train to death. Documents and personal belongings were confiscated from the passengers. They were undressed, driven with sticks to the edge of this ravine, to the abyss. And then the lock sound the lock click, the machine gun's deadly patter, and the first cars with innocent victims moved from this terrible platform in internal darkness. Then a new departure, another click of the lock, machine gun, darkness. This is repeated again and again, and again, and again, and again, and again. And it seems that this horror 
had no end. In the first two days, the Nazis executed 33,771 Jews in Babinia. Almost all the men were at war by that time. So the people who were executed here were mostly elderly people, women and children above three years of age. Children under the age of three were not spared by the Nazis. No, they just were killed without counting. Two layers of corpses, a layer of soil, again two layers of corpses, again a layer of soil. A Nazi plane was circling over the ravine day and night, the noise of which drowned out the shots. But it could not drown out the terrible moan which, according to the eyewitnesses, was heard over Babinia for several more days. And the ground was trembling of those buried alive who were trying to get out from under the rubble. In the next two years, the Nazis executed almost the entire Jewish population of Kiev and Babinia, and then killed the Roma, people, Ukrainians, prisoners of war, and lawbreakers, without thinking, without hesitation, without counting. The invaders even planned to open a soap factory here. Perhaps the crazy Nazi fanatics believed that soap washes away people's sins for killing people. How many were left to lie here forever? Nobody can tell this exactly today. The Nuremberg trial mentioned the figure of about 100,000 people. The most recent research maintains that there were probably about 200,000 people. For the Nazis, those thousands did not matter, but they matter to us, because every new thousand of victims implied another thousand years of pain, the pain that will last, although there is hardly any time that can alleviate this pain. The tragedy of Babniya affected everyone, even if no direct relative, or friend, or acquaintance of theirs was killed here. It affected everyone, every person. He considers oneself a human, because what happened here is a crime against our species, against the concept of humanity. However horrible it may sound, Babinia is in fact a monument to humans. In all the worst and best manifestations, a human can kill, a human dies at the hands of another human being. A human who retained silence and made a deal with conscience, a human with a conscience impossible to negotiate with, who shouted out loud about those crimes, a human who shot and believed it was the right thing to do, a human who saved and knew that it was the right thing. To every human being who has both good and bad in them. The question is, what exactly will prevail at the end of the day? That is the question. Our civilization is developing as a spiral. History always put us in front of a choice, like at the junction. Mankind found itself at the crossroads because of Nazism 
which offered two paths. The first one, to expose the fangs, turn into an animal and kill others, like the predators do. And the second, to remember that we are human, and we are humane, and we will defeat any beast if we do not become beasts ourselves. We will overcome fear and find the good, bright human in ourselves. Nazism was defeated not only by the actual weapons, but also by the more powerful weapon of the human soul, humanism, the weapon of mercy, which was in the hands of those who chose the second path. There are so many of them, we don't know about all of them, we have to learn their stories about their real exploits, so that everyone who saved Jews during the Holocaust is awarded and is given the high title of the righteous among the nations. Among those known today, 2,659 Ukrainians hold this title. We are proud of you. We are proud of each of you. And we will always be a state where the main value is a human being, not any kind of ideology. Ladies and gentlemen, dear citizens of Ukraine, dear international guests, I would like to thank all those who came to share with us the common pain in the 80th anniversary of the terrible tragedy of Bavnia. Both my invitation and your visit are not some kind of a political or diplomatic courtesy. It is a proof of our common values, a test for like-minded people, which, in my opinion, we passed successfully. And I find it very symbolic and powerful that presidents of Israel and Germany are here with us today. Dear Itzhak Herzog and Frank Walter Steinmeier, I also want to thank you and uh, acknowledge the presence uh, of uh, speakers of uh, parliaments of Poland, Sweden, and Georgia, vice speakers of uh, the Czech, Austrian, Polish, Lithuanian, Latvian parliaments, the U.S. Special Envoy for Holocaust Issues, rabbis, the leaders of clergy, Nathan Sharansky, ambassadors and representatives of the diplomatic corps, and, of course, the highly respected experts, uh, all the scholars, uh, philanthropists, and other figures from around the world dealing with the issue of the Holocaust. Babanya is uh, our common tragedy of the Jewish and the Ukrainian peoples, a black, ugly page in the book of the world history. It is also disgusting how the authorities treated this tragedy at different times. There was the time when they tried to tear out this page, erase it, hide it behind the wall of stone silence. Speaking of it directly and without metaphors, we can say that in the 1950s, the Soviet authorities decided to dump production waste from brick factories of Petrivka in Babin Yar. In the end, attempts to conceal one tragedy led to another one, the Kurenivka tragedy, which destroyed about 1,500 human lives. There was the time when they tried to ignore that page of Babanya, to live uh, as it, uh, if it never happened, never existed, 
and they try to build a stadium, a skating ring on that very spot, a TV center, a shooting range on the side of the mass killings. There was the time when they finally stopped being silent about Babnia. But unfortunately, when they started talking, it didn't mean that they started acting. There were many statements, many promises, presentations, concepts, and uh, in total many years without a decent memorial complex in this place. I am happy that after so many arguments, obstacles, different buts, we finally started moving. The state, the government, together with the public, Babinya Holocaust Memorial Center, investors, historians, scientists, scholars, architects, and many other experts have begun the process when Babinya Memorial Complex and National Historical Memorial Reserve will finally be established. New objects appear here every month. And in a few years, uh, this place will become a part of a single large-scale complex of remembrance for Babaniya. It will allow us to fully experience the horror, the pain, the suffering caused by Nazism, racism, anti-Semitism, xenophobia, and intolerance. Yes, unfortunately, it will not help those killed here, but it will help the living, those who need to know about it, remember it, pass it on to their children and grandchildren, so that when we get to the next round of this, the next next turn of the spiral in development of this civilization, there will be no junction anymore, so that we all have just one path, the path of human being, which will all choose with deep respect for the memory of all the victims of Bavania, the Holocaust, the second, and I would like to hope the last world war. For the peaceful and happy future of our children. For the peaceful and happy future of our children's children. For the peaceful and happy future of all the coming generations on planet Earth. Thank you. Gidon Kremer and soloists of the Kremerata Baltica Orchestra.
respected excellencies, dear friends, allow me, a humble musician, to say a couple of words. My genes somehow are as well related to the terrible Bobby Yard events. My father lost in the ghetto of his homeland, Latvia, 35 relatives. Among them, his wife and his one and a half years old daughter. We know as well that Jews were exterminated in all Baltic countries, especially in Lithuania, Latvia, Estonia. When my older daughter recently told me, after being in an archive, I found evidence when your sister was killed, I was in shock. I never thought I had a sister. I was born after the war. My mother was German, and this language became the first one I spoke. Past, present, and future meet at this point. Atrocities happen these days, too. What is terrible are not only the atrocities, but the indifference some people experience acknowledging it. Reflecting on it, yeah, I must say, after watching last night Sergei Loznitz's film, if we live with prejudices and no empathy, we become animals. Indifference amplifies it, while love and music are healing powers. Bobby Yar should always remind us how important it is to become and to remain human.
President of Israel, Itzhak Herzog. There is an ancient Jewish prayer called Yitzko. In the Jewish calendar, we usually recite Yitzko, the prayer to elevate the souls of the departed, be they relatives or people whose death had national significance. On the most sacred dates and festivals for our people. This past month, we marked several of these occasions. With your permission, as President of the State of Israel, the State of the Jewish people, I would like to recite the Yitzko prayer for the elevation of the souls of our brothers and sisters, babies, children, women, men, and the elderly, shot, massacred, and murdered in cold blood here a place that became the biggest mass grave on the European soil, in the Valley of Death of Baban Yar, in the most terrible tragedy to befall the Jewish people and the family of humanity at mankind's darkest hour, the Holocaust. There was nobody to recite the Yitzko prayer for them. May God remember the souls of our brethren, children of Israel, victims of the Holocaust and its heroes, the souls of the six million of Israel, who were killed, murdered, suffocated, and buried alive, and the holy communities destroyed uh, for the sanctification of the name. May God remember their binding, the binding of all of Israel's other martyrs and heroes since time immemorial, and may he bind their souls up in the bond of life, those gentle and beloved in their lives, and their death not separated. May they rest in peace, and may we say Amen. Your Excellency Volodymyr Zelensky and uh, the First Lady Elena, President of Ukraine, Your Excellency uh, Frank Walter Steinmeier, uh, President of Germany, and uh, the First Lady Elke, families of survivors, those who are with us and those watching, uh, honorary guests. I come here as the President of the State of Israel, the nation state of the Jewish people. I come here from Jerusalem, our eternal capital. In the heart of Jerusalem, in the Israeli parliament, the Knesset, on the government floor is a painting by the painter Joseph Kuskovsky, who was born in Ukraine and studied art in Kiev. Led to slaughter, Babin Yar is the name of the painting. It shows men, women, and children walking in silence, in deadly darkness. The jackboots of the Nazi devil and local police officers pointing their weapons at them, setting sharp fang dogs on them. In the middle of the painting, which nobody who has ever seen it ever, even once can ever forget, is a woman holding in one hand her young daughter and in the other clutching her baby to the chest. Surrounded by parents and children, brothers and sisters, all together on their way to their terrifying death here in the heart of darkness. Thousands of times have I walked up those stairs, and time and again I paused and looked at the picture. I felt a pinch in my heart, appalled by the atrocity. I thought about how at the end of the walk those Jews were stripped naked, thrown into the valley of death, and massacred in a hail of bullets here at the Babin Yar 
Every time leaders from around the world visited, I showed them the picture and told them the story of the massacre at Babin Yar, a chapter that must be studied till the last generation. There was no colder or more awful act of murder, no more murderous representation of the Holocaust by bullets than the Babin Yar massacre. There is no escaping the terrible thought that the sun rose over this valley, the birds chirped, the forest was quiet, and the butchers, they butchered. For two days, the machine guns of the Nazis, death squads, and alas, also local collaborators, mowed down tens of thousands of the Jews of Kiev and the region. Whole families were erased. We are joined here today by Marina Vrabechik. Marina is the granddaughter of Nadia Elgert. Her son's daughter, Ilya Ilusha, both of them, Nadia and Ilusha, managed to miraculously escape the pits alive. At Babinia, Nadia lost 26 members of her family, her parents, her brothers, her sisters, and their children. Mikhail Sitko, the last survivor from Babinia, was only six, when the massacre took place. Mikhail made Aliyah to Israel. This is what he describes, and I quote, We walked my mother, my brother Grisha, my sister Clara, age three and a half, and my baby brother Volodya, age just four months. My mother stood with a baby in her arms. Clara clutched her skirt. The policeman grabbed Clara and hit her over the head. He stepped on her chest and suffocated her to death. My mother fainted, the baby fell, the policeman crushed it with his boot and shot my mother. They grabbed everyone by the feet and threw them into the valley. Indeed, ladies and gentlemen, three terrible crimes were witnessed by this valley. The first was the massacre, the erasure of human beings. The second and the third were the cover-up and the denial, the erasure of evidence and the erasure of memory. The desire to erase determined the extent of the annihilation. Tens of thousands of people and yet no records were kept. The bodies were burnt and the ashes were pulverized. From most of the people murdered at Babaniya, no trace survived neither a name nor a memory. The time for memory has come. That is why we are here. Ladies and gentlemen, 80 years have passed. Exactly 30 years ago, an independent Ukraine was established, and diplomatic relations with Israel were formed. The Jewish people have a long and complicated history, interwoven with that of Ukraine. On the soil of Ukraine, for centuries, there flourished one of the greatest and most important Jewish communities in the world, leaders and statesmen, intellectuals, poets, and great rabbis. They all worked, thought, and wrote on the soil of Ukraine. Here, on this soil, flourished Hasidism. Here flourished several of the leaders of Zionism. Here were born and raised important leaders of the State of Israel, and here were also terrible pogroms against Jews throughout the ages. Here, too, was the massacre of Bab and Yar, a tragic event that must never be erased from the annals of the family of nations, an eternal scar on the surface of our planet. The establishment of Bab and Yar Holocaust Memorial Center which tells the story of the 2.5 million Jews of Eastern Europe, including 1.5 million Ukrainian Jews who were murdered and buried in mass graves, is an important step and an important chapter of the shared history of Ukraine and Israel, of Ukraine and of the Jewish people. It corrects the historic injustice of many years of denial and forgetting and represents a lesson learned and a study resource for future generations. Let us make no mistake, even in the present, Holocaust denial is still alive and kicking. Anti-Semitism still exists. 
Just in the past day, we all had of another ugly manifestation of anti-Semitism at the Auschwitz extermination camp in the form of anti-Semitic graffiti that disgraces the memory of the people killed at this terrible death camp. We, world leaders, must all vigorously condemn the slightest hint of this phenomenon and fight it with all our might. Commemoration and remembrance are vital for the whole of humanity against evil, cruelty and apathy. In order that we not forget what Shoah, what destruction one person can do to another, by deed or by silence, how far hatred, ignorance, anti-Semitism and racism can reach, what they can do to human beings created in the image of God. As we Jewish communities around the whole world read last Shabbat in the first parsha of the Hebrew Bible, Bereshit, we must ensure for the whole of humanity from this wretched place of all places, from a place where the world bore witness, knew and was silent, that there shall never ever be another Baben Yah. I want to thank everyone who has played a role in the sacred task of Holocaust remembrance and commemoration and the establishment of the Baben Yah Holocaust Memorial Center, and chiefly the President of Ukraine, Volodymyr Zelensky, and your government, and of course, I would like to thank you, my friend, Nathan Sharansky, chairman of uh, Baben Yah Holocaust Memorial Center, and to those who have accompanied this center since its inception, Mikhail Friedman, um, Herman Hahn, Viktor Pinchuk, Vladimir Klitschko, Ronald Lauda, and others. For as we know today, this decision, and certainly the establishment of this center, has made a tremendous contribution to the discovery of hundreds of new names from our brothers and sisters executed at Babania. Every such name is a world in its own right, a world that was destroyed, a world of which something, through memory, nevertheless remains with us. Shaul Chernichovsky, one of the greatest Hebrew poets, composed here in this land, I believe, one of the most important and best-known poems of the Hebrew revival. Thus he wrote, Rejoice, for I'll have faith in mankind, for in mankind I believe, for I shall yet have faith in mankind, in its spirit great and bold. I too believe in man, we believe in man. That is why we are all here for man, for mankind. Earth, cover not the blood of our brothers and sisters, May the memory of our brothers and sisters remain in all of our hearts, in the heart of the nation, and in the hearts of all humanity. Gideon Kramer and Kramerata Baltica.
President of the Federal Republic of Germany, Frank Walter Steinmeier. Über Babijan, da redet der Wildwuchs, das Gras. Wild grasses rustle over Babijan. Here silently all screams, and head in hand I feel my hair changing shade to gray, and I myself like one long soundless scream. No fiber of my body will forget this. Nichts, keine Faser in mir. Uh, what pain, what anguish, what suffering, a suffering that leaves us without words. Many of you will be familiar with the lines of this poem, written by Evgeny Yevtushenko in 1961. It broke down the wall of silence, the taboo that had until then surrounded the matter of the Jews here in Ukraine and across the Soviet Union. The music that we have Viele just heard from the Zeilen. Deutsche Symphony Evgeny Orchestra Yevtushenko Berlin, too, leaves us wordless and deeply affected. Dmitry Shostakovich's symphony, in, inspired tabu, by Yevtushenko's poem, stands as a musical memorial to the victims of Babylonia. It was writers, musicians, intellectuals who first dared to address the crimes committed here eight years ago. We owe them a great deal. They uncovered the memory of these crimes and paved the way at last for remembrance. As a German and as a Germany's federal president, it is a hard path that brings me here to Baba Niya. But at the same time, I'm grateful to be here. I thank you, the descendants of the victims. I thank you, Boris Zabarko. And I thank you, the people of Kiev. I'm also especially pleased to be here with you, President Zelensky, and you, President Herzog. And deeply grateful for this opportunity for us to remember and pay tribute together. Here in Babanya, in the last days of September 1941, German troops met at about 34,000 Jews. It was Germans who perpetrated those atrocities. Words fail us in the knowledge of inconceivable cruelty and brutality. This act it was not an act of reprisal. The mass murder of Kiev's Jews was a meticulously planned crime, planned and carried out by members of the SS, the security police of the Wehrmacht. All of them were involved. On the morning of um, September 28th, writes of Kiev teacher in her first-hand account of those days, she witnessed an endless row of people moving through the street. Women, men, young girls, children, elderly people, entire families were going. They were walking in silence. It was terrible. Most of them believed they were to be resettled elsewhere. In the ravine, the German troops ordered the unsuspecting victims to undress and forced them to lie on the ground, face down on the bodies of those who were already dead. Then they shot them. Women and men, young girls, children, elderly people, entire families, 33,000, 771 people in just two days. Their mothers were supplied with warm meals, drinks and liquor. 
Only a handful of Jews survived. The crime against humanity that was the Holocaust did not begin in the German factories of death. In Auschwitz, Treblinka, Sobibor, Majdanek, Belzec. It began earlier than that, as the German invaders first pushed eastward in forests on the outskirts of villages. Well over a million Jews in Ukraine lost their lives to the Holocaust by bullets. Here in Kiev, in Odessa, in Berdychev, in Lipovets, in Chernivtsi, Mizor, in so many other places. Who in my country, in Germany, knows about this Holocaust by bullets today? Who knows these names, these blood-soaked names? All of these places have no suitable place in our, in our memory. On the map of our memory, Ukraine is sketched in far too lightly, far too vaguely. And so it is important to me to be here today. And it was important to me to visit Kurilkivka today, too, a small northern town where, over the course of two days, 6,700 men, women, and children were murdered. I'm here to remember today. Because we must remember, in order to recognize where untrammeled hatred and nationalism, anti-Semitism and vile racist doctrines can lead. The German war of aggression and extermination was a matter of barbarity. It cost millions of people their lives. They were killed, murdered, enslaved as forced laborers, deported. People whom the Nazis did not consider to be people here in Ukraine, a whole swath of land, were to be systematically cleansed. That was the wording of the orders, and Kiev was to be raised to the ground. Here in Babania, too, the killing continued after the massacre of the Jews in, of Kiev in 1943, when the Germans retreated. Tens of thousands of uh, Sinti and Roma, members of the Ukrainian liberation movement, disabled people, prisoners of war, lost their lives in this ravine. The perpetrators attempted to erase all of the traces to cover up their crimes, but they could not be erased. Their effects are felt even now. The shadows cast by the crimes, the scars left by the war, they are still visible today. The suffering inflicted in this war continues today in so many families, in so many villages and towns in your country, in Ukraine. For this reason, too, we must remember there can be no bright future without candid remembrance. I stand before you today as Germany's federal president and bow down before the dead in grief and sorrow. And at the same time, I am deeply thankful for the reconciliation with you, President Zelensky, the people of Ukraine and the descendants of the victims have made possible by extending your hand to us Germans. Reconciliation is not something that can be requested. It can only be granted. And so I am all the more grateful for the close partnership that unites our As two Deutsche countries, President Zelensky, today. And all the more grateful for the shared foundation to which we are committed, international law 
and human dignity, the freedom of all peoples, and their right to political self-determination and territorial integrity, and a safe and peaceful Europe. We stand on this foundation and we must protect it. That, too, is part of the responsibility imposed on us by our history. To all of you, the descendants of the victims, the people of Ukraine, to you, President Zelensky, President Herzog, I would like to say today that we Germans are aware of the responsibility imposed on us by history. We can never draw a line under this responsibility. It is a responsibility for our shared future. President Herzog, how I wish that I could state this as an unconditional truth. How I wish that I could say we Germans have learned the lessons of history once and for all. But I cannot. It pains and angers me that anti-Semitism is, in Germany too, in Germany of all places, gaining strength once again. It pains and angers me. Dass Antisemitismus auch in Deutschland, ausgerechnet in Deutschland, wieder stärker geworden ist. Es schmerzt mich und macht mich zornig, dass ausgerechnet in der Notlage einer Pandemie, that in the throes of a pandemic of old times, old hatred is being reworked in new conspiracy theories, whipping up enmity, threats and violence. The evils of the past are reimagined in a new guise. For us Germans, there can only be one response, never again. The fight must go on, the fight against anti-Semitism and all forms of hatred and the reckoning with the crimes committed in those dark days, a process in which, as we have seen very recently, Legal proceedings are one essential element. Ten years ago in Italy, Yevgeny Yevtushenko, the author of Babinia poem, met Wolf Biermann, the German poet and singer, whose father was murdered in Auschwitz and who was expelled by the East German regime in 19. After their meeting, Wolf Biermann composed a new version of Yevtushenko's poem in German, and he presented those lines to me for my trip today. I would like to end with these lines with the words of two poets, with these, in a certain sense, shared words on Babaniya on the horrors for which there are, in truth, no words in memory of the victims whom we must never forget. Und schreie offenen Mundes, Steine stumm. Ich stehe alleine hier im Abgrund wie vom eigenen Grab, bin selbst ein Greis, bin Mutter, das erschossene Kind. Sie alle sind versammelt hier für immer da, ergraut bin ich vor lauter Grauen. Denk ich an 41, an das schlimmste Schreckensjahr.
Borisa Barka, former prisoner of Sharvrod Ghetto, is chairman of all Ukrainian Association of Jews, former ghetto prisoners and prisoners of Nazi concentration camps. President of uh, Israel, President of Germany, President of Ukraine, ladies and gentlemen, dear friends, I'm really a former prisoner of Sargharad Ghetto, and here with me others uh, from many villages and cities of Ukraine who survived the Holocaust. In those terrible days of the mass shootings in Babin Yar, we were not there. We were in other places. Only a few people remained in our organization of all the survivors, one of whom was rescued by her grandmother. Nobody else. Had we been here, we would have been killed. But even earlier, before Bavania, we and our families were in the Nazi-occupied territory. We witnessed the Holocaust from bullets, injustice, murder, death, pogroms, to executions in Babin Yar. We saw mass shootings in Vinnytsia, in Zhutome, in Bila Tserkva, where the Nazis shot nine innocent Jewish children in August 1941. After the tragedy of Babniya, it covered the whole country. We do not have a single family that has not been affected by the Holocaust. There is bloody murders, even 80 years later, will not give us peace. The ashes of the victims are still in our hearts. And all those years we have been trying to understand with bitterness and pain how this unprecedented tragedy even became possible. Why couldn't the world prevent the Holocaust? How we learned these lessons from the past, lessons that have not lost relevance today. And finally, how can we preserve the memory of the Holocaust in order to prevent its recurrence in the future? Today, history opens possibility for us to live in a new way. And if we are eager to save future generations from such tragedies, to find a way to a civilized European family of nations, 
that we must make every effort to ensure that the memory of the victims of Nazism and those who fought against it is never forgotten. If we allow the memory of the Holocaust to be extinguished, and if we allow the historical events connected with them to be denied, then we ourselves will join those crimes. Because all this can happen again if we do not tell the truth about how it really was, the truth about every person, about the executioner and the victim, about the righteous people of the world, about the passive observer, traitor, collaborator, because every human life is unique. We must not only remember the past, but also be well aware of the threats posed to the world by racial intolerance, anti-Semitism, and disrespect for human dignity. The Holocaust has taught us the lesson that anti-Semitism fascism and Nazism are the same thing and they must be destroyed. This is a commitment not only for the Jewish people but it is also a commitment for all the nations of the world. We are the last generation to survive. We try to do everything we can. We are writing books on the events, the memoirs that have been published in Ukraine, the United Kingdom and Germany, and I am very excited to present our latest book, Life in the Shadow of Death, to the Presidents of Israel, Germany and Ukraine. I have already laid the foundation stone for the future Holocaust Museum here in Ukraine three times. It failed three times. And finally, now we hope that the memorial complex will be completed during our lifetime and we will see it through joint efforts, including Holocaust Memorial Center Babinia. Dear friends, I am grateful to you for bringing up the memory of the Holocaust, and I wish we all never see this ever again. Thank you for listening. Viktor Pinchuk, member of the supervisory board for Babinia Holocaust Memorial Center. Your Excellences, dear Presidents, dear guests, I was listening to presentations of the three presidents and thinking to myself that when the tragedy happened, none of the states was even on the map 80 years ago. Independent Ukraine, the State of Israel, the United and Democratic Federal Republic of Germany, 
They were all born at later stage. Descendants of those who have suffered had not yet been born. Hundreds of thousands, millions of children, grandchildren, great-grandchildren. It's a lucky chance that I was born. From the very beginning, I would like to say briefly that we had the feelings, thoughts, dreams, and aspirations with which we participated in the financing and creation of this memorial. Me, my friends and partners, we all are Ukrainian Jews. And if we, our generation, were born and can live in Ukraine, it means that our grandmothers and grandparents, our parents were not shot in Babinia and many other places of mass burial of Jews. We learned about Babanya not from Evgeny Yevtushenko's great poetry and not from the great music of Shostakovich. We learned about it from our mothers, grandparents. They survived, but their friends, neighbors, and relatives were shot right here. In the Soviet Union, we could learn about Babaniya only from our grandparents and parents. All this was silence, and we lived in the atmosphere of lies. Then the USSR collapsed. We grew up, we achieved certain things, and you know, with the success comes a sense of responsibility too, like a need to contribute to life in the country and the society. Among the most important projects which we support, there was always a dream to tell the truth about Babaniya. We approached it in various ways. I was lucky in 2006 to be the producer of a film about the Holocaust in Ukraine. That film was screened in cinema theaters, teachers uh, taught memorial lessons in schools. Then in 2012, uh, I had the, the great honor of speaking with Father Patrick Dubois and uh, organizing Holocaust exhibitions in the museums of New York, Kiev, and Dnipro. I'm very glad that today he is the head of the supervisory board of this memorial center. But I felt that wasn't enough. I talked to the guests of our country. It was a stupid task for me, the Babin Ya. I always knew that we needed to talk more about it. It turned out that in 2015, 2016, we started talking about it for real. My friends, brothers Klitschko and Svetoslav Karchuk, Paul Fursik and Nathan Sharansky, we began to discuss that. And exactly five years ago, on the 75th anniversary of this tragedy, we announced our commitment to create a memorial. We are aware of our huge, enormous responsibility. And when we say we, I mean a large group of mostly young Ukrainians who are making this memorial, who are working here every day, and uh, who dream of uh, doing it with us. 
not to mention famous artists, architects, sculptors. We know that this story must be told in all truth. Those who come here will feel great pain, but also sympathy, and I hope that they will also feel pride and respect. As here Ukraine is telling the truth about Babadia, the most terrible truth and the brightest truth. Only those can be strong who are ready to admit their mistakes, to tell the truth. And I know that Ukraine and the Ukrainian people are destined to be the most successful country in the family of the European nations. I would like to say um, from our team, on behalf of it, to tell you about the huge support we receive from the government. The uncompromising support included in that from the President, whose personal involvement in this project allows for development of this memorial and the fact that the memorial becomes real. A memorial is a memory, a memory that is needed by those who died here, but mostly it is necessary for the future generations. We hope that people will come looking for this memory, that the memory will be shared by all Ukrainians. We also want the grandchildren and the great-grandchildren of those Germans who shot at Jews in Babania to come for this truth, this memory. We want the descendants of those who helped the Germans to come here. Moreover, those great Ukrainians who risked their lives to save the Jews. You know, people from all over the world call me because they also crave for that truth, and they also want a part in creating of this memorial. On behalf of our large team at the Memorial Center, I want to assure you that the process of creating the memorial is completely transparent, and we invite everyone of those for whom it is important to contribute to it. I'm not talking about finance now. Come, we need your emotions, your memories, documents, ideas, your life stories. Together, we can create a majestic memorial that humanity so desperately needs. Because here, as never before, we will talk about the terrible doings that human being is capable of. And about the majestic high deeds that human being is capable of. And about how blurred the line is between the first and the second. Perhaps this memorial will help us better understand what can be done and what can never be done, so that this line is never broken. I am convinced that working together we can create a majestic Ukrainian Holocaust memorial that will help humanity survive in the 21st century. It is with these thoughts, dreams and hopes 
that a large group of people are working here to create Babanya Holocaust Memorial Complex. Thank you. Anthony J. Blinken, United States Secretary of State. This is the report filed by one of the Nazis' mobile killing squads, the Eitzengruppen, on October 2nd, 1941. Sonderkommando 4A, in collaboration with the group staff and two commandos of the Police Regiment South, on 29 and 30 September 1941, executed 33,771 Jews in Kyiv. A concise, clinical summary that contained an immeasurable amount of human suffering. The victims at Babi Yar were forced down into the ravine, where they were made to lie in neat rows on top of the bodies of those who had already been executed. Then, according to an eyewitness, and I quote, a marksman came along and shot each Jew in the neck, uninterruptedly, with no distinction being made between men, women, and children, end quote. Row upon row, for two days. The killers worked in shifts. Some took breaks around a bonfire to talk and drink coffee. Not everyone who was shot died immediately. Some suffocated under the weight of the bodies. Survivors later said that the earth around the ravine moved and moaned for days after the mass killings, as if the land itself were rebelling against what it had been asked to hold. As we mark the 80th anniversary of Babi Yar, we remember that both the victims and the perpetrators were human beings. Every one of the Jews killed in those first two days was a man or woman, boy or girl, with a full, distinct life with loves and hopes. And every one of the dozens of men who pulled the triggers was also an individual who made a choice. We also remember that for much of the last eight decades, the world did not remember what happened at Babi Yar. That was by design. In 1943, some of the same men from the German Sonderkommando 4A returned to Babi Yar to try to erase evidence of the massacre. They forced prisoners from concentration camps to dig up the remains and place them in huge pyres where they were doused in gasoline and set on fire. Then the Nazis executed those prisoners too. But the Nazis were not alone in trying to bury what had happened. For decades, Soviet history admitted that the 33,771 victims of those first two days and tens of thousands more executed later were Jews and that they were killed because they were Jews. 30 years after the massacre, in 1971, my late stepfather, Samuel Pizar, was asked to join a small delegation of Americans for a series of off-the-record discussions with leaders from the Soviet Union. Members on both sides were drawn from different walks of life, the arts, politics, business, with the aim of fostering a candid dialogue on tough issues. The conference was held in Kyiv, and from the outset, the remarks from much of the Soviet delegation were hostile and rife with anti-Semitism. My stepfather, a Jew who had been born in Poland and Bialystok, had lost almost everyone he loved in the Holocaust. He survived Auschwitz and several other Nazi concentration camps. When members of the Soviet delegation used terms like, and I quote, the Jewish Nazis of New York, end quote, and gave a tour of Kyiv that focused on the suffering and heroism of the city's population during the war without once mentioning the Jews, my stepfather said, the numbers on my arm began to itch. So he asked to address the Soviet delegation. Speaking off the cuff, he talked about the dangers of anti-Semitism, the hard work societies must do to root out ethnic and racial hatred, the perils of covering up the darkest parts of our history. And he closed with a suggestion. Yesterday, he said, you gave us an opportunity of seeing the memorials to your great patriotic war against the Nazis. Today, it would be worth our while to pay a visit to Babi Yar. The Soviet delegation didn't respond in the moment, but when the session ended, the American delegation decided to visit the site that day. They were brought by bus to the edge of a wood, walked across a clearing where, as my stepfather later wrote, there was, and I quote, 
nothing to tell of the infamous mass grave under the newly planted birch trees. Then another bus arrived. The Soviet delegation descended and quietly joined the visit. After uh, that visit, my stepfather said, the tone of the dialogue softened considerably. Fifty years since that conference, I've been thinking a lot about why he urged the delegations to visit Babi Yar. And I believe it was because he knew that one of the most powerful ways to conquer hatred is to show people where it leads, its human consequences. He made those delegates see that he could just as easily have been one of the people buried in that ravine, or one of the six million. He knew that when we fail to remember, or when we intentionally erase parts of our history, we further dehumanize the victims. And we deprive ourselves and future generations of the lessons we must learn and act on. And he knew the power of changing the mind of even a single member of that Soviet delegation. Because the only thing that ever stands between us and atrocities is our fellow human beings. For just as people have the capacity to be perpetrators, so can they be righteous. So on this anniversary, we honor the memory of all those lost at Babi Yar. We recommit ourselves to ensuring that their full history is told. And we pledge to act every day so that history is not repeated. Thank you for listening. Natan Sharansky, Chairman of the Supervisory Board of Babaniya Holocaust Memorial Center. Dear President of Free Independent Ukraine, Volodymyr Zelensky. The President of Germany, the delegations from different countries, the leaders of Jewish organizations and communities from America and Europe, our dear survivors of ghettos. It was described again and again what a hell was here. But if you'll go and read in Dante Alighieri or in any other author of Middle Ages about the hell, the Gehenom, Ad, you'll find nothing like these scenes which happened just here, just here, six and then seven layers of freshly killed people, and some more and more have to lie and will be killed. You will never find such scenes in the literature. So, Babi Yar became the symbol of Holocaust by bullets, of awful crime of Nazi regime. But Babi Yar, at the same time, is the symbol of the crime of Soviet communist regime, crime of erasing the memory about the Holocaust, erasing here on the earth, trying to turn this raven into the center of waste waters, and then in the stadium, and then in the park, where people can walk in the morning with the dogs, and erasing it from our history. I was born in 1948 in the city of Donetsk, then Stalin, city which unfortunately is suffering a lot in these days. And it was only a few years after Holocaust. And I'm living among the killing fields of Holocaust and know nothing about it. Two miles, two miles from my home, there was Rikovskaya 4-4B mine. There was a lot of mines around. This one happened not to work already for many years. But it had a big pit, almost 400 meters deep and 15 meters broad. 
75,000 people were killed and thrown into the pit. It is the second biggest mass grave after Babi Yar. 75,000 people, many of them children, were thrown alive and were killed when, while falling. And I know nothing about it. Not far from this, there, are, there is a small town, Artemovsk. There are no deep mines, but there are edits, uh, Stolnya, horizontal pit. So Germans, Nazi criminals, helped by the local supporters, are bringing hundreds of Jews into it and are sealing it. And people are dying, some of them are dying in a few hours, some a few days, some a few weeks, but everybody dies. And we play our games about the war, we play our games about victories of, of Red Army, we are very proud by the medals which our fathers brought from the four years of war, and we know nothing about one and a half million Jews killed. That was the policy of the Soviet Union. And then I remember when finally this word Babi Yar, which was like a secret Samizdat underground word, something awful, when it appeared on, on, in the newspaper, and my father with trembling hands and trembling voice is reading to me, 13 year old boy, this poem which we just now heard. And he says, finally we can talk about it. But he was wrong. Next day he started a campaign against this poem. The poet is forced to change the words. And when great composer Shostakovich is writing the music, symphony which we just now heard, it was played only once in Moscow, it was prohibited. And when I'm becoming the uh, activist, human rights activist and Jewish activist uh, in Moscow, I was detained many times. One of my, of my first detained was when I was on my way on the 29th of September. I was on my way to Kiev, to Babi Yar. So the question is, why? After all, Soviet Union have won the war against Nazis. Why are they making such a secret? What changed in their policy? And unfortunately, we checked it again and again and said historians and look at the archives, what happened between 44 and 47. <laughs> the answer is very simple. The reason is anti-Semitism. Of course, Soviet regime persecuted many national, religious, and social groups. As a founder of Helsinki Group and as a spokesman of this group, I had an opportunity to participate in preparing and publishing in the free world many documents about persecutions against Ukrainian nationals about persecutions against Crimea Tatars, about persecutions against Pentecostals in Siberia, about persecutions against Catholic priests in Vilna. And it so happened that just under 1945, after 1945, Stalin and his assistants decided at the time to head come to go after the Jews. And Jewish institutions were closed, and Jewish poets were arrested, tortured, and killed, and Jewish doctors were forced by tortures to confess that they're going to poison all the Soviet leaders. And their trial was planned on Pesach. But on Purim, Stalin dies. And probably it saved a lot of lives. But the policy of the Soviet Union, the policy of discrimination of Jews, demonization of Jews and Jewish states continued almost until the end of the Soviet Union. So 
those who are trying to encourage hate towards Jews are not interested, are not interested simply to show, to remind where it can take the world, that what starts from Jews is not finished with Jews, how it can destroy all the beginnings of civil society, how it can create new holocaust. And this connection, this connection between anti-Semitism and denial of Holocaust, that's what makes it so actual today. Because today the world is different. As exactly now it was said, thanks God there is no Nazi Germany. There is no Soviet communist regime. And there is a state of Israel, the best guarantor, the best guarantor of the continuity of Jewish people. But anti-Semitism on the rise, in the east and the west, on the left and the right. And whether it is anti-Semitism of the leaders of the Iranian regime, we, who openly speak about the world without Israel, or whether it is the anti-Semitism of the extremists in France or in the United States who are taking synagogues in Toulouse and in Halle and in Pittsburgh and in Brooklyn, or whether it is anti-Semitism of the so-called academicians, professors, who are again speaking that Zionism is racism and that Jewish national state is illegitimate, they all are denying Holocaust or reshaping Holocaust or cheapening it. And that is why, that is why it is so important for us. That's why I'm so proud to be the chairman of this Memorial Center of Babi Yar. Yes, it is a very ambitious plan because we want to, to turn the place which is the symbol of the erasing of the memory of the Holocaust to turn it into the biggest museum about Holocaust by bullets to become the biggest research center and educational center. And that's why we are so grateful to Ukrainian parliament who passed legislation against anti-Semitism, a very powerful one. And that's why we are so grateful to Ukrainian president and to all his team for close cooperation. In fact, only yesterday when I said to one of these people from President Zelensky team that thank you for your support of our project. He was almost insulted. He said, what? It is not our project. I immediately agreed. It has to be Jewish and Ukrainian project. It, has to, it is very important for Jews, for our history, to know what happened here. It is very important for Ukraine to be the leading nation in Europe among those who are looking at the past frankly speaking about the past and building the future. Dear friend, just in these days, I think two days ago, we published the list of 159 uh, Nazis who were killing Jews and other people in Babi Yar. In the last months, we brought more than 1,000 names of the victims who were killed in Babi Yar. And we are going to bring the names of those who were supporting Nazis. And the Nazis could never kill so many Jews so quickly if they were not helping, find, finding help from the uh, local supporters. And no less important, and maybe the most important, we are going to continue to increase this unique list of now more than 2,600 Ukrainian families, priests and peasants and teachers who are risking the life of their own children by saving Jews. It is very important that the Holocaust will have the faces and that everybody will be reminded that even when you go through the valley of death, 
you are making moral choices. Our sages say the one who saves one person saves the whole world. I would say for our situation, it means that it depends on the personal moral decision of each of us, whether our world will be saved or destroyed. And to the victims, to those people who were brought and thrown here in, in the raven of YBR and killed, we can say only, blessed be their memory, Yezi Hram Baruch, Am Israel Hai. Thank you.